Hello, church. I have the privilege today of being able to speak and to be able to give you uh, the message instead of Brian. I, it's always a privilege to be able to speak to you about what God has been putting on my heart. Let's pray as we start. Lord, thank you very much for this time that we can have together. Lord, I pray that you would help me to speak your word clearly, help us all to be able to apply your word, Lord, for your glory's sake. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege we have of knowing you and being able to know your word. In your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. I was thinking about the whole time of this lockdown that it's been. We are, I think we're up to about day 70 or so. And thinking of the challenges it's been for all of us to be able to adjust to this time. One of the things that's especially difficult right now is how to be able to care for one another when we can't actually be with one another. And that is one time that we can have. We can have screen time with one another. We can have texts. We can have messages. But how can we actually show one another that we care for one another? Paul had a similar situation. He actually was a church planter in the New Testament, and one of the things that he did was that he planted various churches. One of the ones that he did in about the year 50 AD was the church in Thessalonica. And this church was done on his second missionary journey. He had just come over to Europe and was in Philippi. In Philippi, he had all sorts of persecution. He was beaten, he was put in prison, and then he had to flee. And when he came to Thessalonica, he also had only a very short time there. In fact, he was only there probably for about a month. And during that time, he was able to preach the gospel, but he also had the persecution follow him, and he had to leave within about a month's time. And so he was concerned about this newly planted church in Thessalonica, about how they were doing in their walks with the Lord. And so he sent back some of his co-workers, Timothy and others, to be able to check on how they were doing. In the process of them returning to Paul when he was probably at Corinth, is that he heard the good report that they were still walking with the Lord and still thought very highly of Paul. And so Paul wrote this letter as an appreciation of thanks to God and also for the Thessalonian believers of all that they were doing and still holding fast to the Lord despite all the persecution they were having. And so one of the things that we're going to see through this passage in 1 Thessalonians is how Paul cared for these believers even when he wasn't there. And it can tell, tell, teach us a lot about how to do that ourselves because when we do the things that Paul has in mind here, then we can imitate him and be effective ones that care for others. And so we're going to see actually three different emphases in this 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1-8. to eight. We're going to see that first of all, we care by giving God's message to those that we serve and care for in the Lord. Then we also can be truthful and sincere messengers in our conduct. Finally, by loving these people, we serve like new mamas. And that's going to be our third point, is how to be able to do that as well like moms. Since it is uh, on Mother's Day or near, near Mother's Day, it's a good sermon in relation to that as well. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to read the passage, and then we'll continue. So this is 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. It says, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But after we had suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. For exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ we might have asserted our authority. But we proved to be gentle among you, as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. And so again, we're going to see in this passage how Paul is continuing to care for these believers, again, through the message, the messenger, and mama. And so let's look at these, the first of these three M's, the message. Paul says that, first of all, that he spoke the gospel of God. And that's important to understand because the gospel of God means it's from God, and it's also about God. It's not about ourselves. It's about him and not who we are. And you say, well, what is that gospel? Well, right in the beginning, right before the passage that I just read, Paul defines exactly what that gospel was. He talked about what the Thessalonians and how they reacted to him. It says that they turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, 
whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. And so there's two really important aspects of the gospel here. First of all, it says that God is alive. He's living and true. He's not a dead God like the idols, but he's actually one that we have to have to do with because he is who he is. And because he is who he is, because he is a God who is living and true and just, we're in a problem because we do things that do not abide by God's word. And so we are under his wrath, under his punishment, because he as a righteous judge cannot allow those things to go unpunished. But it says here that Jesus is the one who came to rescue us. And so he's the one who paid the price for our sins. And then our response, as it says in this passage, is to wait on him, to trust him, to have a confident expectation in him to save us and not ourselves. And so Paul says that his coming to them was not in vain. It wasn't empty. Because in chapter 1, verse 5, it says that when he came, that they knew that when he came, that his message was in power, in the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and that they had full confidence. They themselves could see that it was true and that they experienced the truth of this, which is one of those things that we can see the gospel being true because it's not only just information, it's actually life transformational. God actually changes us and we know that to be true because of who he is and how he works in our lives. Paul said that he did these things to show the truth of the gospel, but as well he did three things which he made sure that he did not do in communicating the gospel. You see, in Thessalonica, Paul was not the only one spouting off any kind of philosophy or teaching. There were a lot of street preachers who would come out and say things for the crowd. And Paul wanted to contrast himself with the other people that, in a sense, he was competing against. And so in verse 5, and actually verse 3, he says, Our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. Three things that he did not do. Error, impurity, and deceit. Error means that it was wrong information, it was incorrect, and it can be very misleading if you have incorrect information. He said it wasn't out of impurity. Paul didn't do it out of wrong motives to try to somehow trick them or to exploit them. And it says he also didn't do it out of deceit, which is really a wrong method, because it's really in there to have to try to trick someone to do something for you. And so he didn't do any of these things. He showed that his message was actually one of truth that that mirrored who God was, that God was true. He also says as well that he had boldness in our God to speak amid much uh, persecution. And it was interesting that he didn't say that he received boldness from God, but that he had boldness in our God. You see, the boldness that we have when we speak the gospel is not something that's so much that God gives us, but he actually lives through us, and we receive it because we're in a relationship with God. And so Paul says that it's something that in his close walking with the Lord, Then he had that strength to be able to give them that message, even when he had many people who were opposing him. And so my thought is for this first part on the message is how well do we know the gospel? Have we received the gospel? Do we know that Jesus is actually the one who's rescuing us and we're waiting on him? And then how well do we know? Are we convinced of it? Do we see the necessity of it? And really that people have to be able to respond to it to be able to have and to avoid the wrath to come. And finally, do we speak that that gospel in boldness? Boldness knowing that it's really true and that it's God's message, not only for us, but for the world. So that's the first point, God's message. The next one is on the messenger, how we should conduct ourselves so that we would show ourselves to be caring of others. This is in verses four to six. Paul says, first of all, that Paul, like we, have been approved by God and have been entrusted with the gospel. That word improved really is the idea is that uh, someone of a supervisor giving a responsibility or an assignment, a decision by them so that this task would be carried out. And so Paul is seeing that his work is actually being coming from God. But then it also says that he is entrusted with the gospel. That entrusting is the idea of giving something valuable uh, to someone else so that they would care for it. And the idea that's in trusting the gospel of God, it's God's message, as we saw before, and it's about God. It's not about ourselves, and so it's about him. And so Paul saw his responsibility to God. Then he goes right into talking about into his motives. Paul said that he did not do this to please men, but actually to please God, who examines his heart. And again, he contrasts this with those, those street preachers that I mentioned before. Street preachers that could say wrong things, as we saw before in the content, But they also could have street preachers who did the wrong kinds of conduct, 
And he said he didn't do this to actually to please men, but actually for God himself. And it would be almost, if you almost could think of a good example, would be as if, and we know that we have street vendors here in Vienna. Think of if you had a street vendor who, instead of having their typical box of uh, out front to collect money or maybe an open guitar case, that they didn't have anything at all. They were doing their work instead of just pleasing men. They actually did it just for the love of doing that. Or they thought it was so important they were going to let any kind of money inhibit someone from actually hearing the message. This was how Paul did it. He didn't want that the motives to be questioned, and so he did it differently than everyone else, and he contrasted it with how other people would have done it. Paul says that this way that he did it, he actually did not do three different things that he had mentioned in his motives. And this is said in verse 5. It says, He never came with flattering speech, he didn't seek the glory of men, and he didn't have a pretext for greed. And these three things are ones that show that Paul was different. First of all, for flattery. Flattery is to make people feel good about themselves. But in this context, it's really almost trying to manipulate their feelings so that you can get something out of them. It's really a kind of exploitation done in this way. The next one, that pretext for, or a cloak for greed, that's really a covering. And so Paul is saying that he wasn't in there to try to get money from anyone else, but he was actually there free of charge. Finally, it says that he didn't seek glory from men, either from them or anyone else. That glory is the idea of getting fame or some kind of status or reputation or praise from others. And the common element with all these three kind of wrong motivations, you know what it is? It's all about me. It's all about self. Because when it's about self, it's really not about the other person. Even though it might look like it, really you're in it for yourself and you're just using someone else, whether their their approval or their money or their praise, some way to get it your own way. And so Paul said, I'm not going to do it that way. In fact, this is another way that you can see that the gospel is true. Not only is the content so that we can actually know and we can see that God has changed our lives, but the early apostles and the early followers of Jesus, they didn't do anything else other than wanting to abide by the truth. They were told and they practiced the idea that they had to be sincere and they weren't going to do things for anyone else. They saw their responsibility before God. You know, that kind of attitude is really a bad ground for any kind of conspiracy So if you think of someone trying to cover up the idea that Jesus really didn't rise from the dead or that someone stole the body, they're told all the time that they need to be true and act truthfully. And that's not the way that conspiracies can happen and continue to grow because they're not going to look for that and they're not going to abide by those things. So I was thinking about how to apply this point about being a good messenger. And I think one of the things that really comes to me is How am I doing in terms of my motivation for doing different works for the Lord to help people? It's a good idea, especially ahead of time, even before this sermon, I was thinking, I want to do this so that God is glorified, not so that somehow I'd say, oh, Doug Stonery did a really good job preaching. And after a service for the Lord, another thing we can check on is, how did I do? Was I doing that for God or was I doing it so people would really notice me or was it for my own good rather than for their good? And Paul wanted to make sure that it was really for God that he was doing these things, not to please people. Our third point after the message, God's truth for us, and the second one, messenger, about having the right conduct that would really reflect that truth, is really about mama. It says in verses 7 and 8, Paul talks about how he acted and behaved like a mom with newborn children. And it's really interesting how he said this. He said, first of all, he proved himself to be like that. They saw this as something that they could actually see and experience for themselves, how Paul acted like a mom. It's interesting today being Mother's Day, how this is a really apropos for today. Paul acted like a mom, even though he was never a mom, he was never married, and obviously he didn't even have any children. But I think it'd be really good for you to hear from a mom who's had children. My wife, Tricia, we've had two children, Ryan and Megan. And so Trish is going to introduce a little bit about how her experience of being a mom, and in a sense, how Paul reflected that with some of her own perspectives. So let's listen to Trisha on this one. I was very thankful that Doug asked me to share with you a little bit of the things that I've learned as being a mom. Um, it's something that not many people have the opportunity to do. And so here's how I was thinking about Paul being gentle with his children. Before the kids were born, I really loved the Lord but oftentimes the things that I did were out of duty. Then we had Ryan, 
was amazing. He could do nothing on his own. Couldn't hold his own head up. He couldn't roll over by himself, just like every child. But I loved him so much. And it was okay. Though it didn't bother me that he couldn't do those things. Those were things I was willing to do for him. And I was thinking about how it says that Paul is gentle with the people like that nursing mother is with her child. And I thought, Lord, I want to be gentle like that. I want to be gentle that I don't expect people to have a Christian attitude. I don't expect them to act a certain way. Like those babies, there's nothing that they can do for themselves. And that's how I want to be as a mother to other people. That's what I want to be like with non-believers too. I don't want to expect them to have certain criteria for their lives, certain expectations of how they should act. I want to be like that mother that gives them what they need patiently, especially the gospel with love. And today being a Mother's Day type of celebration, this is really appropriate. So Paul, this is really, in a sense, a continuation of the messenger. He was saying that he didn't want his motives to be this way. He actually wanted his conduct to actually imitate what moms were like. It's interesting, Paul never was married, obviously never had any children, but he acted like a mom. He learned from the moms around him and actually imitated them in his care for the Thessalonian believers. And it says in verses 7 and 8, first of all, Paul proved himself to be like a mom among them. In other words, they saw his conduct. They actually could say, yeah, that's what it's like. That's what he's doing, because they actually could see it over a consistent basis. The first thing that Paul did, he said that he was gentle among them. That gentle is an interesting term. It's not just being, not being harsh, but gentle. If you think of the idea that someone is humble when they think less of themselves, Actually, a person who is gentle is they think of themselves less. They're not concerned about themselves. And this is really like it says a, a mom with a newborn, like my wife Trisha was, is they're totally consumed, totally cherishing, totally focused in on the child that they have. There's really almost no concern for self, almost no regard for self. You're totally focused in on the other person. And this is what Paul was thinking, is that it was really for others and that he had a love for them. It says that as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her children, that tenderly cares, cherish, love, adore, and all of these terms show of just a great emotional attachment that we should have for the people that we serve. Paul continues and he says, having a fond affection for you, so fond affection for you, and that's another trait of, of a mom, is that there's an emotional bond of love. It's not a business relationship, it's not some kind of, well, I'm going to put up with him, but it's a total bond of love to be able to give myself to this other person. And it's interesting that Paul said that when he was, um, had this fond, of, fond affection, he said, we were well pleased. He was more than willing to impart two things to the Thessalonian believers. First of all, it says the gospel of God, the best news that they could ever hear, the best way that they could ever live, he's giving to them. So nothing better he could do. And then he says, not only the gospel of the God, but our own lives as well. All that he could give, sacrificing himself for these believers, is what he was doing, like moms do, for their children. And it's also interesting that he said at the end, he said, because you became very dear to us. It's not somehow that they deserved it, but that it was to us as we were the ones who decided, we were the ones that that love depended on. Babies and many times people that we work with, they don't deserve love, but we love them nonetheless because it's our decision to love them. They became beloved to us. We made that decision. And you can see that as well. And that's how, it, how God treated us as, as believers in him. It says in chapter, five, uh, chapter 1, verse 5, that we became beloved by God. And so the Thessalonian believers were beloved by God and so that they themselves could now love others with that same love that God showed to them. And so God requires only of us what he shows of us and only what actually can be done through us, and that's the same way, is that we love other people. I think this is a real challenge for me as I continue to serve people, either with them or for them. How well do I love them? Do I just see them as just, well, it's just here I go again, and it's not too much fun, and things are real difficult? Or do I really cherish them? Do I really love them? 
how do I do of really showing that fond, fond affection and that bond of emotional love to them and that commitment to them? Not thinking of myself, but thinking of them. That's a real challenge, and I want to continue to grow in that and praying that the Lord would continue to, to move me and to help me to grow in this area. So we see in these three areas how Paul was caring for the Thessalonian believers and how we can care for the people around us. He did it through the message of giving them the great news that God loves them, gave their son for them, and that he's the one who saves them. He gave them a second point as being a truthful messenger, one that had good conduct with right motives. And then finally, like a mom, to really love the people that they serve, not doing it out of obligation, but really doing it because we cherish them and they're our beloved. So I hope that these things have really helped you as you think about people that you're serving with and for. Even if you don't have someone that you're actually discipling or mentoring, these are all relationships that we have with one another. How well do we care for one another by doing these things? I would encourage you to write down maybe some of the ways God is speaking to you, maybe in one of these three areas or all three. Think of how you can have your conduct be more in line with that of what Paul said. Paul commended the Thessalonians because they imitated him, and he commends us by imitating him as well. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you don't give us uh, directions, that you don't give us the strength to follow. Lord, help us to be bold in our speech to make your gospel known. Lord, give us right motives to be able to serve others without having wrong motives on ourselves or being focused on ourselves. But Lord, just like moms with their kids, with the babies that they love, that we would love them as well. Help us, Lord, to imitate these ways and show us the ways that we can do this better. Lord, thank you that we're your beloved. And so, Lord, that we see how you have loved us so we can love others. Lord, we praise you that you are good. We thank you in your son's name. Amen.